That's great. So welcome to meeting number seven. I'm Tom Zaychek and and uh, we've been having meetings and uh, have some more fun today, I'm sure. To welcome ARCI members and all the other club members that we've got today. It's great that we've got people from all over the country joining us. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, we're going to uh, get right into a minute. I just wanted to welcome all of you to be a presenter as well to these meetings. Uh, you see how uh, much fun we're having here. We've got, in fact, today we've got two new presenters that are joining us. Newbies, if you want to call them that. So that, that'll be fun to see. Things, there's an email address right there that you can send your, uh, your comments to. Our next meeting will be in uh, February on the 20th. And as Matt reminded you, we here is we set up a prearranged time with the presenters and we get going and the presenters can typically uh, wait uh, till the end of their presentation for questions, but they can also welcome them, welcome them at any time. If, if you don't have a question, please stay on mute. That's a very important point that keeps uh, things uh, coherent. So here's what we've got going on today. Uh, I'm gonna finish up this introduction in a second, then I'm gonna hand it over to Matt, who's gonna give you a brief uh, overview of Zoom and some of the features that maybe you haven't used before that are kind of helpful in our case here. And then we're gonna start into part two of the California Historical Radio Society, Society's Museum Tour with Steve Cushman. He's, he's back and uh, this is gonna be pretty exciting. Uh, presentations on, on In Their World. Uh, Jay Stewart's gonna show you his uh, cathedral radio presentation. And uh, Mike White's going to show you his do-it-yourself power supply for his uh, vintage Swan 250. And then uh, finishing up our presentations, we're going to have Tom Kleinschmidt continue with his radio preservation series. So after we get done with the presentations, we're going to do an items for sale. Items were pretty successful. And then after that, we're going to do an open session. So we'll get right into it. Matt, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Um, I'm actually trying to trying. I'm sharing a different way. I'm curious. Are we seeing this as mostly full screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. With just the bar on the top and the bottom, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. I think one of these days I'm going to do uh, a uh, specific on uh, the presentation in Zoom, but not this morning. Um. So we all know, I believe, about active speaker controls in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, it's where you control how you, how, how the uh, audience appears to you. Uh, remember that in Zoom, it is the recipient who controls the screens and how, they, how they're laid out. Uh, the presenter only decides what they're presenting, but it's the recipient that, that decides where things go and how it looks. So you've got your two modes, active speaker and gallery, and um, the number of uh, windows in gallery will vary by your computer performance. Um, it's either got uh, a look like this, if you've got a quick computer, or if it's a slower computer, I think it's only nine. You can get the meeting controls by um, pulling focus to the Zoom app, which basically just means that you're on the, uh, you clicked somewhere on the window that's got Zoom up and move the mouse around or hit the up, down arrow keys, um, or you can touch the alt key. The odd thing about this, it's not really odd though, but it, this only works if you're actually, if Windows is focused on Zoom at the time. If you're looking at a PowerPoint, this won't work. Um, on a Mac, these are on the bottom. On Windows, these are on the top. Main ones here, mute and unmute. Uh, that's fairly obvious, but if you see the little up arrow here on the unmute 
and mute button, this is where you select your audio devices. And if somebody is having difficulty with their internet, uh, they can also switch over to phone audio where you dial a telephone number off a landline. And I bet you most of us still have landlines. Um, and that's by clicking here on switching to phone audio. Um, you can also select your camera. If you flip over to the start video button and use that arrow and play with virtual backgrounds. Uh, to share a screen or to share content, you hit that green share button. And uh, once you hit the share button, this menu will pop up. And then you have uh, two main options. One is to share the screen itself. Um, and the other is to share an application. Uh, this time I'm sharing my, uh, this is a little PowerPoint here. I'm sharing this application in the uh, application window down here on the bottom rather than sharing the screen. Uh, the reason is that uh, if you sharing in PowerPoint, it can quite easily or will by default take over all your monitors, which doesn't leave a monitor for Zoom and then you can't see the audience when you're presenting. Um, but the main thing I wanted to touch on here is that uh, we use chat in Zoom. Uh, for example, uh, at the end of the meeting and when we do our for sale and wanted, people will put their contact information up in chat. And rather than writing all that stuff down, before the meeting ends, go to chat, um, hit the ellipses here or the three dots, and then there'll be an option there to save the chat to your computer. So as an example, I just put out in a chat message to everyone, the invitation to register for our next meeting. So you don't need to wait for the email, you can just click on that and register. And only one more thing, everybody here knows this, but um, I don't know if you're talking to other club members uh, and they're struggling with this, uh, please remind them that we need to pre-register to join. Some people, believe it or not, are still struggling with the notion that we register in advance before we click the link. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Um, I will end my share and take it away. Okay. Uh, that introductory uh, topic there, that, that was great to, to hear about that. Also has some polls course of our meeting and uh, the polls will just pop up on your screen and you just click your answer and he accumulates all the answers and we give you the results so it's kind of an interesting thing and we'll be doing that so we'll get going here um, our first presenter is Steve Cushman who a few months ago is uh, introductory tour to his museum which is just a fantastic place so let's uh, continue on with Steve's tour Part two of the music. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, good. Yes, okay. Um, we saw almost all of our facility a couple of months ago and uh, the two places we didn't see were our electronic shop and our great room. For, for many reasons, we didn't see them. Now they are sort of ready for prime time. So we're gonna play a video here. And if you have any comments, you can comment after the video and we'll, uh, we'll share and we'll see if we can do this. Okay. Okay, let me, uh, let me see here. We're gonna see if I can get this any fuller here. Ah, okay, here we go, here we go. Can everybody hear that? We're hearing light music. I'm not sure where it's coming okay. from. Okay, well, let me, hold on a second here. Let me make sure. Uh, I, I played, this was fine before. Um, uh, when you share, you gotta make sure you're sharing audio too. Yeah, screen sharing. Uh, 
mute. We don't want to mute. Select a flank. Select a uh, microphone. Uh, hold on a second. We turn the corner and go through the door. Can you hear that? The wonderful CHRS electronics this, shop. Yes. Uh, this is a six position shop. And uh, what we do in here is we repair radios and artifacts for the museum. Uh, the, uh, our techs are allowed to work on their own stuff. If you're a member, you can come in and do that. Um, we take in work from outside sometimes. And, uh, what we also do here is we have, uh, radio clinics where if you're having a problem working on something at home, you come here and, uh, sit next to an expert. You guys will figure it out together and you will learn. Meanwhile, you're looking at uh, some of the stuff we have in our shop. I'll back up this way so you can see our, uh, our benches. And uh, we had our techs clean their benches uh, since they've been sort of messed up since the pandemic started. Usually this is really a hub of activity, but uh, of course, during the pandemic, uh, not much is going on except some sorting and organizing. For example, all our knobs have been organized somewhat, and they, the knobs just uh, just sort of go on forever here, be it large and or small. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when Radio Shack was going out of business, one of our members wisely uh, and kindly uh, purchased a bunch of the great uh, drawers uh, from Radio Shack uh, for our shop. And uh, we keep a lot of our parts there. It keeps things very organized. When we had the shop built, we had a deep sink put in here for washing chassis, and it works very well for washing hands. Um, Another view of our shop. It's very bright. It's very airy. We have uh, access to our outside. You can see more of our drawers, more of our parts, uh, some more of our benches here. And I'll whip around. I don't want to do it into the sun, so I'm going to go this way. And we'll come all the way around projects to be repaired. And this is some of our uh, test equipment. We have uh, quite a few uh, Hickok tube testers and lots of test gear here that uh, being an organizer, I don't know much about. All I know is we've got a lot of really good test gear and equipment for working on radios and uh, everybody is uh, very pleased uh, with what we have here. I know that this is our government tube analyzer, which the government probably paid many thousands of dollars for uh, when it was new. More test gear here. Um, come around here. This was the uh, one of the last projects that we worked on before the pandemic. This is a, a restored Cros Crosley TV. This is a, uh, a an old radio station clock that we are working on restoring for use in our uh, control room. Uh, another station, uh, our computer that we uh, use for looking up schematics and whatever, our printer for schematics. And you'll see several areas in this shop that are just kind of full of parts and stuff. And this is for from continuous donations and uh, these um, eventually and slowly are getting filed away into our parts cabinet. 
Uh, if we come over here, these are all radios on this shelf that need to be repaired for the CHRS Museum. And coming over here, this is our little shop library where we have all the two manuals and stuff uh, the repair folks need for restoring sets. Again, more, uh, more equipment. And uh, that really is about all I can show you at the shop. And I'm sure you're going to have some questions. So we'll uh, go up here and uh, say goodbye to Mr. Repairman. And that's the shop. Okay. So, any questions? How did you get all that gear? Army. How did uh, the club get all that gear? We have been taking in uh, donations of, of test equipment since about 2003. 2003 to 2013, we were at our former building and had a shop there. Um, and then in, uh, and so all along, we've been uh, getting gear, gear donated to us. Every bit of gear you saw there was donated. And our guys uh, fix it, calibrate it, we use it here. What we can't use, uh, we sell to our members or give to our members if they can't afford it. And so they can, you know, have it for their shop. And uh, then we sell on eBay also a lot of our extra stuff. We have an eBay site that's very successful. Um, <clears throat> the other thing we do is teach. We have uh, stri strict repair, you know, straight repair classes for AA5s and specialty things and alignment and all that stuff. But the clinics are the most, uh, the most valuable thing we have where you stand next to an expert, you fix it together. And there's usually when there's no COVID, it's five or six people standing around watching how this process is done and learning. You know, part of what we do and part of why the shop is the biggest uh, facility of biggest functioning facility uh, is that it's real important to uh, preserve this, uh, you know, to teach the younger folks how to repair. And we do have some younger folks who are interested. Thank goodness. Uh, Steve, I'm a little late to the game. I missed the last couple of meetings, so I'm not familiar with uh, your organization and do you have a website or contact info? We do. Our website is uh, chrsradio.com. You can find it that way. California Historical Radio Society. Uh, that's a long one. The short one is chrsradio.com. That pretty much has got all about us. And if you go down to the bottom of our webpage, uh, I send out, or the group sends out, a uh, an email newsletter every week, every Friday night it comes out, about what's going on with the club. We share information about other clubs, and we share other clubs' newsletters, and we show what's going on at Radio Central, and uh, we pump that out every Friday. And if you just go right down to the bottom of the our front page on the website, it'll say, uh, join our email group. And the email, it's a closed loop. The emails only come from me. There's no spam. It's very, and it really, uh, that's our best uh, way to inform everybody about what's going on. Great. Thank you. That'd be great to have, have an, an operation like that right here local to Chicago too. <laughs> well, if you ever get out here, we encourage everybody to come visit it. We're very fortunate uh, that we have this. Uh, we're the only ones out here. We're the only ones uh, out here that own our own building. No one's going to throw us out. And we're, we're doing very well. We did very well. We took in uh, this past year, uh, we took in uh, almost 48 grand and just, just donations for the year that, uh, that kept us uh, going. We have a good, good support out here. So I know we've got a time problem. If any other questions about the shop, um, I'll take them now. If not, I'll start the the tour of our big room. Uh, what I didn't say about our great room is it is about 
60 feet long by 30 feet wide by uh, almost 20 feet high. So uh, it was a former um, telephone building built in 1900. We'll talk a little bit about that. So if everybody's okay, I'll start the next video. Um, bear with me. Okay, hold on. Uh, sorry. Give me, give me, give me. Well, here we are taking our lift up into the California Historical Radio Society's great room. This is Radio Central's main uh, area, our main room that was uh, constructed in 1903 and, excuse me, 1900. And I can show you what was going on there. This is what the building looked like in 1900. And this was what was going on in this room in about 1938. So um, when we came in, we needed to remove all the plaster that was falling on us. And we needed to remove the fall ceilings and the asbestos ceilings, which uh, there were two of them. And uh, we are leaving. Um, this is the front of the building, and you can see it's got some very old 1900 details. We're going to be remodeling all of this room except for the front, which we will do in another uh, phase. And I want to show you something here. We'll go past Mr. DeForest here and open this little thing. And you can see that all the original detail is still on the outside of the building from the Mission Revival style. And we are going to go back to that. So and what do we have up here? Uh, first of all, we have our little museum store where you can get all the things you should be able to get in a museum store. Hats, t-shirts, cups, uh, restored radios, and a full selection of uh, CHRS journals. Those fine journals you get when you become members of CHRS. These right here, these are all radios for sale. And uh, these are radios that are not fitting into our collection and radios that we would like to move on to find new homes for. As we come around here, we can see uh, a, nice, uh, a nice McMurdo silver. And this uh, speaker cabinet was built by hand from a drawing by one of our members. It's got 103 pieces in it, I believe. He's since uh, passed away, but this was our friend Jim Brott, who uh, was a great restorer. As we come back here a little bit more, why it is our motel radios. We've got a few varieties of the motel radio. Uh, the radio tell. This one we like just because it's got those great dancing people on it. Uh, here's another another coin up. And some of our uh, radios and a nice uh, transmitter and tower site that was created uh, by one of our members. And you can see the guy, the engineer is up there. You know, uh, check in on his transmitter. Vacuum tubes, we got them. Here are some, a few transmitting tubes, and here is other parts of our vacuum tube collection. We have lots of tubes. There's only a few of them on display here, and eventually uh, we will get many more on display. This room is a work in progress. It is not finished by any means. Basically what you see is temporary exhibits and displays. Some of our Scott collection, um, a really nice, uh, another nice McMurdo Silver, uh, Masterpiece 4. 
Um, all, all of our sets are in pretty darn good shape. Here is another Scott. So, and coming around here to our uh, Midwest, you know, these were very, very stylish radios. Cabinets weren't built very well, but they sure were stylish. As we move down here, uh, some of, we can look up here at some of our uh, novelty collection, a nice Zenith, the Electro, Electrola R40, very early model with uh, never been out of this area. It's got Oakland radio station, Oakland radio store tubes in it. All the handwritten stations are all local stations. And this one had a um, acoustic pickup and it also has an electric pickup and it's got a huge honking uh, amplifier down there and very large speaker um an rca um console uh, another rca atwater kent uh a pop belly stove radio and a bilco someday we'll get around to uh, restoring the clock radio and I'm just going to go down and show you some of the things we have along the wall here. Um, and then we'll come back and see what's going on down the middle. These are most of our good radios in this room. We have some uh, also in storage that will eventually come out here. This is the, uh, the wonderful Tower of Transistors. Um, you know, transistors. People like those sometimes. And more of uh, more radios in our collection. Here's a couple of nice German radios. We have a propensity for German sets here. They're all so very nice. They're so pretty and they, uh, and they work so well. And some of them we have are in absolutely pristine conditions like, uh, like this like this telephone can hear it really is in fine fine shape and then here's a very unusual siemens radio and we'll open the door here and you can see what's going on inside here another good looking uh european set down here is a kellogg radio there weren't many kellogg's made kellogg mostly made uh, telephone equipment uh if we look here these are some of our parts, some of the antique parts that we have and all these things that go inside radios and make them work. Most of this stuff is uh, brand new in the box that we have collected over, over the years. Uh, if we go up here, this is mostly on this side is mostly crystal sets. And you can see we have quite a good collection of all kinds of crystal sets. We have more, but they're not all on display right now. Now we're at the other end of the room and you can see what's going on here. These are uh, some work tables that we use for projects. We'll come down here and look at this little group. This is a Meisner um, console and people have told me that they had never seen a Meisner console before. It's kind of got a leatherette front, and it was probably late 40s, early 50s. A couple of more of our better sets. Over here is a uh, Fried Eisman Victrola combination. Uh, the Fried Eisman um, was the radio and amplifier part, and the Victrola was the Victrola part. It also has acoustic pickup, and if you want to attach it, it has an electric pickup also. Here's a couple of greedy sinker phases, uh, and uh, which unusual of this is this is a greedy sinker phase in its own cabinet. As we look over here, this is a uh, this is an, a Palin radio built in uh, San Francisco. We like to concentrate on the San Francisco San Francisco radios, a uh, little Atwater Kent, which I'm sure you've seen before. And the Remler was made in San Francisco, and uh, we try to specialize in those. This is a Remler console, and on top of it is our newly donated 
uh, Remler Infradyne amplifier. This was brand new in the box from the 20s, and we just took it out of the box. Uh, it was just donated to, to us. I donated it, and uh, we had now have it on display. It's got a little wooden stick in there, so you can adjust uh, adjust the amplifier without uh, touching the tubes. The Ring of Zeniths. This is our fine collection of Zenith radios, and I'm just going to go past them and let you take a look. This is our junior stratosphere, and uh, we have really a nice, nice uh, collection of Zenith consoles because they're so nice, and uh, and we like them. And here's. Here's the last one, and you've seen the, the spinet. So let's come down here, we'll take the middle row here. Uh, some more of, some more of, our, of our nice radios, including the Zenith Glass Rods, uh, World's Fair Edition. The, uh, the spade radio, which is really very unusual, given that name by, the, by its side. Um, Philco, RCA, Victor, and uh, a nice little silver tone up here have been restored and is in very, uh, very beautiful shape. And over here, an outwater tent, and it's in the Pooley cabinet. <coughs> So this is a pretty nice looking Atwater Kent radio. Coming down here, there's my there's my dog Zoe. As we come down here, here's uh, um, another Philco with the mystery remote tuner. Coming over here, got another very very nice looking Philco radio with the uh, with the tambour door front. Some more, uh, some more German sets because we like them so very much. This radio down here was bought at one of our flea markets for, by one of our members. He brought it home, he restored it, and then he got tired of it and gave it back to us already restored. It was very nice. And here's probably one of the uh, one of the grandest uh, German sets. It's a uh, it's a Grande, and it's in very very uh, excellent condition, and uh, it's got uh, everything that the old German sets had in it, including a tape recorder. Up here is a great-looking Philips with the uh, with the dial that sort of that sort of floats through here. All oh, very nice, very nice set. Here is a grand radio. Here is the magnificent Magnavox. This was a 50th anniversary edition of the Magnavox, and it's got these uh, all these uh, beautiful glass panels over it. It's got the the uh, what we used to call the Oriental or Asian motif, and uh, sitting on top of it is a little sharp pagoda radio and a little uh, National Panasonic. All these radios have that uh, Asian Asian theme. If we come around here, this is when we're trying to sell. So if anybody wants this beauty, this beautiful Grundig, this one is for sale. And it is a fine, fine radio in excellent condition. Uh, shipping not included. Coming over here, this is some 50s stuff. This is a Hoffman made in Los Angeles. And uh, it's very, very unique. Early hi-fi, it's got this great, it's got this great uh, display for your bass and treble and uh, a separate powered speaker. Again, this is uh, probably uh, late 50s. Coming over here, this is a, uh, a PA system from the, from the Pacific Public Address Company in San Francisco. That's an old timer. And a very nice uh, um, Stromberg Carlson um, console. As we come oh, over here, we can look a little bit, and these are all European radios in this. We got Spanish radios, German radios, Japanese radios, Greek radios, and uh, and and uh, Philips, 
uh, Netherlands radios, and down there on the left is a beautiful uh, Italian Marconi next to a Japanese set. Now I'm going to run you down the wall here of other of other radios that we have in our collection. And uh, if you see anything here that you want to talk about afterwards, we can uh, do that. Here's the famous echo radio. Um, some of our speakers and more of our sets. Bumping things here. Here's a couple of clock radios, real clock radios on top of uh, some modern stuff. Some more uh, old time stuff. Here's a Western Electric uh, 4D radio. And the uh, every radio station in those days was expected to have one of these radios inside the station to monitor its own signal. And there's a nice dictograph paper speaker. Um, some time clocks, a beautiful um, red um, radio. It's a, it's a Philco. With, again, with the uh, floral motif, some other stuff, and just keep looking at a few more radios here, and um, some more of our novelties. Everybody has got to have some novelty radios. Uh, that was a big fad in the 70s, and people are still collecting them, not as much as they used to. Uh, another uh, transmitting tube, a big sucker. And over here is our homage to this building because this building was originally a telephone building and uh, in 1900. And this is our little homage to the telephone uh, portion of this building. So that is really about it. We're gonna walk through here again and I'll point out a couple of more things to you. This is uh, our Atwater Kent Radiodyne uh, set, all in beautiful condition with the green, with the green cans here, and a very lovely uh, ship speaker. Another lovely ship speaker on top of an EverReady battery receiver. Coming around here is uh, up here is uh, Hales, California. Hales was a department store here and uh, they had their own, uh, they had a brand of their own radios. And finally coming around here, this is uh, an Uncle Al's radio. Now Uncle Al made his crystal sets in Oakland, California. And this one is highly unusual because it's part, it's a console. There were never any consoles made. This is just a hollow base to support the radio. And uh, Uncle Al made various versions of this radio. There's one here. There's one where, right over there. You can see another, another Uncle Al. So he made, uh, he made good sets and uh, and they they were local, so that's why we like them. Finally, here's our here's Zoe again, and uh, here is our wall of eye candy radios. These are all sets that I'm sure you all are quite uh, are quite familiar with. Who is that? And um, we like to rotate these in and out of here, but for right now, these are some of the prettiest sets that we have. And this whole area uh, can be used for a presentation. This is our speaker system here. These are Ampex theater speakers, which you don't see very often. All the components are either Ampex or Jim Lansing components. And uh, over in this corner is uh, kind of extra gear. This is our extra uh, broadcasting gear and a few more things. And of course, what we're all about. This is the Crosley Pup. That's uh, what's on our logo. And um, here is a pup and here is an advertisement to it. Um, a hollow watt radio from the Pacific Northwest. And this is our stereo system. Start out with a couple of Macintosh amplifiers, uh, a dual turntable, 
and Crown equipment here, Crown preamp and Crown monitoring. And you can really turn this up and it sounds really good. So this room, I'm going to turn around again and I'll tell you, it's going to be used as our main display gallery. It's going to have uh, uh, radios by decade. It's going to be used to rent out as a community meeting space. The center of this can be cleared and we can set up 50 chairs in here or chairs and tables. And we do rent this room out to the um, uh, broadcast engineers every December for their holiday party here. So it's a great room and it's got great potential. We're going to be redoing all the walls. We're going to be doing all the windows and really turning this into a really uh, place of destination where everybody uh, would like to come see really nice stuff. So that's the big room. That's the great room at Radio Central. And I probably sound like I'm repeating myself, but uh, this is a room we're real proud of. And this is going to be the heart of the building. This and the shop are pretty much the heart of the building. And we're uh, very proud to own this building. That's all. Well, that's fair. Uh, tour of that room. That's that's uh, something that a couple uh, meetings ago. I, that's on my bucket list. I want to get out there. Yeah. Well, if you get out here, you sh you should. It's we don't know that, you know, what's out on the West Coast is not, there's not a lot. There's pretty much us and the, uh, the spot, what they call the Spark Museum now <clears throat> up in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, they have really changed their focus from old time radios to more of a, a they call the Museum of Electricity and Spark, I believe. They have some radios, but they've really gone into electricity for the kids and stuff. We are, we are, we are it out here. And uh, again, we are very fortunate to own the building and we are fortunate to have good support. And we are fortunate to have people that can work on the place and work on the radios. And right now we're going through a process of putting everything we own into a database, into a museum style database. And uh, we've got a little committee doing that and we've got the first hundred items done. <laughs> and once this is finished, it'll be public. You can come into our site and see anything we have, anything we own. If you need a <laughs> reference or, uh, or information about it, we should be able to supply that. And I would say that we probably have 3000 items at this point. So it's a long, slow process, but we're, we're doing stuff like that. Oh, that's fantastic, Steve. That, that database sounds uh, like a really uh, impressive project. I'd be, I'd really love to look at that when it's ready. Yeah. So, so yeah, in the uh, interest of uh, keeping the things moving along here, is there any questions for Steve? Apparently not. I hope everybody enjoyed what they saw. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I stayed last time, but I'm going to sign off. I need to prepare for our, uh, one of our local Zooms in 15 minutes or so here. But thank you for the opportunity of uh, letting me uh, share our facility and our museum. And I wish uh, we were much closer to each other so you guys could just pop on over because on Saturdays, generally when there's no pandemic, we have between, I want to say, 12 and 25 volunteers every Saturday, either working on gear or working on the building. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a great, we have great participation. And again, um, I encourage you guys to stay, stay in touch. CHRSradio.com. Go there and uh, sign up for our email list. And uh, you'll hear from us every week. Okay, Steve. Well, thank you very much. Thank hey, you guys Steve. very much. Happy New Year to you. And uh, it's been a pleasure being with you this morning. I had okay. a question. Yes. Steve? 
Yes. Um, are you, this is John, John Mischewski from Illinois. Are you, uh, are you familiar with the gray uh, torn arm turntables? They're, they're, yeah. they're quite ancient, um, but they're, they're of high quality. What could you tell me about those? Oh the my. Gray, gray torn arm? There it is right there. I didn't expect you to just pull one. Up. <laughs> we have two. If you can, I'll sort of turn. We have two. Uh, we have two RCA C70 turntables here, both equipped with RCA arms. We're adding the gray arm to this table so that we can uh, safely play mono 33s. So that is going to be added here. Yeah, we are, we are uh, familiar with those. We qu have quite a collection of transcription arms, which we cannot use, and we're going to be putting up on eBay. I don't think there are any grays uh, that we're selling, but we're selling uh, uh, some RCAs and some General Electric uh, tone arms. Okay. And uh, what about, you had some, you were showing some studio turntables. Are those yeah. in your museum or are you going to be putting those up for sale? Yeah, the Spartas, we're not quite sure. We we had the Spartas set up in our control room at KRE, but in this control room, we've gone back a little before the Spartas and we have two of the RCAs. We may set up a 60s DJ booth uh, somewhere in the big room. And in that case, we would use the Spartas. Now the RCA table that you were talking about is that I don't know I don't know my tables going back that far, so is that it looks like a pretty solid table. It is. It's a, it was an industry standard for years and years. They were using them uh, through the fifties and almost into the sixties, um, and they were around since the thirties uh, with various uh, incarnations of them. But the C seventy. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's a slip cue turntable and it's, oh, you can see it, it's all, all original, 78 uh, heavy, uh, wide groove 33s, uh, lateral or vertical uh, play. So it was pretty versatile and pretty unbreakable. And we've never replaced the stylus on this. And I'm venture to say, that's probably the original stylus on that turntable. Oh my! <laughs> That's good are those, stuff. Are those tables? I are those that. John and Steve, um, we've got other presenters lined up to go here, and we're running short on time. So oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, it's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, if anybody wants to contact me, I'm Steve at chrsradio.com, and we can talk um, you, over the email. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank it's, you. All right. Our thanks, everybody. Good. Sorry to keep you. Have a good day and a good meeting. Bye-bye. Right, thanks. Okay. Um, uh, next, we're going to go see a presentation from Jay Stewart about his first restoration. And I want to remind you that we're going to have some polls here uh, to ask uh, if you're selling anything today. That helps us understand how much time we need to set aside for that and how much how much uh, budget we have for the time uh, in, remaining in the meeting. So, uh, Tom, are you also going to discuss the show and tell? Uh, yeah, we're also going to have a show and tell at the end here uh, where you can just, as we did in the invite, we, uh, we said that you can <laughs> about the, uh, any topic you want. So, that's just a reminder, but I'd like to get on with the presentation. So let's go to Jay. Jay well, I are just, you ready to go? Sorry, I did uh, just launch a quick. Okay. We'll, we'll answer this whole question first. Right. Let's give this about 30 seconds. Okay, so we have four folks who want or are already willing to uh, do a show and tell. 
and um, at the end, uh, or, or uh, between the next uh, presentation, I'll do another poll. Thanks. So go yeah, ahead, Jay. All right, guys. Well, I'm, I'm the newbie here, as Steve alluded to. I'm trying to learn this whole, ha uh, this whole uh, hobby. Uh, sometimes a little intimidated by uh, you guys, but nonetheless, I am uh, moving ahead and very well encouraged. Um, so hopefully, let me share my screen uh, right here. And is it working? Yeah, we see it. Wonderful. So I've been obviously in, you know, collecting radios here and there. I've just been fascinated since I was a kid, crystal radios and that. Um, I obviously did not follow the engineering role. I ended up in real estate, but um, really at the, uh, you know, getting involved in the club has really focused me and given me the, uh, um, the motivation to try to start renovating some of these. So I'm going to quick go through really from my perspective in the challenges uh, on what I did. I, I picked up a radio. This is my wife got this for me for Christmas. It is a, um, you know, just a very basic Philco Jr. Um, I was amazed, even though it's considered to be inexpensive back then it was 300 bucks. So basically you're buying a 48 inch or a 42 inch TV so, I mean, even though it was inexpensive, it's still, radios were expensive back then. So it was four tubes. I was thinking that might be a little easier for me to get my hands around. Um, and, you know, so really what first thing I had to do um, was just find a lot of information on this. And luckily, you know, with the Google machine and that, you can find tons of um, tons of information on that. The Philco bench I found to be amazingly um informative. Um, I found schematics. I learned, I actually had to put together a dim bulb tester. I know we talked about that last, uh, last uh, meeting. Um, and just going through that, I picked up a couple books on it. Um, I kind of feel like I, I know enough to be dangerous, but my real problem is in reading schematics, I, I understand the, what they are, the resistors, capacitors, the symbols of that. I, I just don't know what they all do and how they correlate. I can't look at a schematic and say, you know, that is the amplifier, that was the rectifier. I mean, that's where I need to learn on that. And frankly, Steve's uh, shop sounds really interesting. So started with that. Um, then, you know, I started taking it apart. And sorry, I don't have, I, I wasn't planning on a presentation, so I don't have a full set of, uh, uh, of pictures. But, you know, first thing to do, I, you know, I, I took the, uh, the chassis apart, um, again, reading the, um, a lot of the information, you know, I had to categorize things, clean things, um, you know, and there's a lot of good information and, you know, it, it does clean up pretty well. I think people can take it to an nth degree and, you know, literally polish everything. Uh, maybe I'll get to that point. I, I, I did not do that, but started taking it apart. And then here's where the, the fun and the challenge came. And uh, th th this is where, you know, I, I just had to figure some things out. Tom was helpful. Some of the other guys uh, were helpful here. But what, what I learned quickly was that the schematics don't match the radio. Um, and I know that there were a lot of notes and supplements and things like that, that, you know, in this case, Philco probably put out over the years. I had a hard time following that. And I guess, you know, I don't say I was lazy, but you know, just trying to go through there, it does get a little confusing from a layman's perspective. And, you know, one of the big things there was, you know, looking at the schematics, there are a couple extra capacitors that did not exist on my radio. Um, and there was also a capacitor with a big resistor that wasn't in the same place. Um, so you kind of have to, you know, figure stuff out, um, take some chances and just scratch your head. And, you know, it's a little intimidating, but, you know, I guess one thing I did learn, you aren't going to blow anything up, really. I mean, you know, all of this stuff, you know, you can probably fix if you if you get a little over your skis. So, you know, that, that, that though, was, was hard. I mean, and just trying to find, you know, answers to that. And luckily, you know, I have a resource here with some of you guys. But, you know, someone else who didn't have that, I think it'd be a lot more challenging. Um, 
And then you got to start the surgery. I kind of went through labeled stuff as much as I could. Um, took a lot of photos of the existing, trying to figure out, you know, once I start desoldering that, what I'm doing. I did decide not to replace all of the wiring. I know I've seen some restorations that are just amazing where people have replaced everything. Um, the wiring seemed to be in pretty good shape. I wasn't going to have it running. So I wasn't, you know, all the time. So I wasn't too worried about that. So I started that. And then really first things were that these damn capacitors, um, they are sloppy, they're, you know, uh, but, but again, when you, you find out online, you know, a heat gun can start clearing that out. And uh, I elected to put the capacitors back into the Bakelite um, sh um, um, blocks and start putting that together. And again, you know, you're just kind of, I'm not an engineer, um, but you know, you just go through there and um, you try, you, know, you just write down a lot of what you're taking apart and trying to, to put it back together. Um, I decided, you know, I replaced all the capacitors. As I mentioned, you know, some of the, uh, the, the schematics didn't match, um, but you know, I took some chances and uh, luckily I did figure out some of that stuff because when you're taking out these capacitors, they don't have any markings on them. So you really don't know, you know what you took out, except they're, you know, they're gunking up your screwdrivers and everything when you take them out. But it's, it's amazing that, uh, you know, they, they designed these things and they lasted as long as they did. Um, resistors. Um, I was going to replace these resistors. I, I did a stupid novice mistake. I bought a big set of uh, assorted resistors, but they were quarter watts and realized I probably needed to get a uh, half or a full lot. So I gotta, I gotta go and do that. But that, again, it's not crazy expensive, but it's just stuff you learn. Um, I just didn't think about that on, 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 on what you did. Um, tolerances, for the most part, um, they seemed okay. What I did realize, I mean, I've had a, I got a, a fair ohm meter, digital ohm meter. Um, you gotta, you know, I'm just not as proficient. I'm, I'm good. You figure it out, but it's not like, you know, what I use, you know, calculators and computers and that, you know, exactly what you're doing and just trying to figure out the scales, even of the resistors and things like that. And that's just something, you know, you, you know, a novice like me, you got to start learning about and you, you scratch your head trying to figure out, you know, if, if you got this on the, on the, on the 20 scale, is, is this really within tolerance or not and you're just kind of um, you know bumbling along a little bit and uh, taking some you know trying to figure it out as you go but after talking with uh, Tom I decided not to replace the uh, uh, resistors unless there really was a problem so did that also and I, again this is something I need to learn there, there are coils in there this radio was in pretty good shape so I, I you know nothing appeared to be uh, uh, really messed up. So I kind of took a chance and, um, you know, I cleaned up the outside, the wires inside look good. I did not replace any of those coils. That's something obviously I need to learn a little bit more about uh, moving forward. Um, speakers at the end, I took it apart and was really surprised to find that this thing had been repaired a couple of times. And uh, so I had to learn speaker repair. I had to go out and get speaker cement. I learned, you know, that, I mean, it wasn't hard, but it's just one more thing you have to do. And you know, now I have some speaker repair cement. So next time I'll, I'll be covered on that. Um, but did that, um, then I started it up and damn if it didn't work. Um, I was pretty excited, um, lights came on. I was in the basement, my shop's in the basement. So um, I don't get great reception. I picked up really two stations, one around 1000. I forget what that is on Chicago, but that, and then I got one a little lower on the dial. Um, but I was a little disappointed. I didn't get, um, couldn't pick up LS, um, BBM, um, uh, uh, WGN. So something's not quite right here. Maybe I was, I was kind of attributing that to the, to the basement. Um, then I had, re had to redo the case. I was pretty lucky on that. I'm, I'm pretty handy on woodwork. So this was not as challenging. It was really more sanding. Um, the stain was in good shape. I ended up just sanding it down and then uh, putting on polyurethane, a wipe on polyurethane. Um, and it actually just, it, it, it sparkled. It really came back quickly. So I was lucky on that. Um, and the, the, the cloth was in good shape. So then 
basically put it all back together. Um, I did, you know, put a new antenna on. I did find, I mean, I'm amazed what's out there. I wanted to replace the cloth, the, the power cord. Um, I was going to make my own. I found a place that I could buy a hundred feet of the, 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 the cloth wire. Um, but then I found um, actually one that was made um, on Amazon. So I got a six foot pre-made cloth wire. One thing I need to figure out, I hear you guys do, I got to figure out where to put a fuse. I think, you know, all of these just for safety, you know, you should probably put a fuse on there. I think I know where it is. I'll add it later, but I'll, I'll talk to someone later on that. It's just not clear on where the best place to put a fuse. There's things I got to learn. Um, and then, you know, wrap up, you know, it, it's a nice looking radio. Um, I need to understand the volume. It doesn't get as loud as I would like. Um, it also is not bringing in as many stations as I'd like. So there might be something, maybe it's the tuning I have to figure out in the back. Um, I'm not sure if there is, you know, an issue with, again, get reading in the schematics, if there might be something wrong with the amplifier or that tube. I do not have a tube tester, um, but I figure someone here will help me shortly. But nonetheless, um, I was really excited and, you know, you know, thanking my wife. Um, Tom has been great. Um, in fact, I bought a radio from you guys. I think I'm gonna try to, that'll be my next project. Bob was great. He actually lives in LaGrange Park. I live in LaGrange. Uh, he was helpful in getting me parts as was Ed. Ed was amazing. And then all of you guys, I, I appreciate, you know, I love this. I feel like a, a newbie, but it, it is an exciting group. And, uh, you know, I know I'm going to learn more. So thank you. Oh, that was great, Jay. Thank you very much. That's very uh, interesting to hear your perspective as a newbie. And that's, you know, there's nothing to be embarrassed about there. I mean, you, you did an excellent job and you had uh, great motivation and you got a great result. So uh, kudos to you for that. And all the people that helped you. So, yep. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, everyone. So that that's my first one. Hopefully, many more. I got to tell you, seeing Steve's museum was just, uh, <laughs> I was drooling. That's beautiful stuff. And I know you guys, we, we have that stuff here and we'll figure it out. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, that's great. Um, and if, if you can hang around uh, for the open chat, I'm sure there'll be some more exchanges going on, but um, we're running a little bit behind right now, so yep. I'd like to uh, uh, move on to the next presentation if we could, Jay. So if you can hang around to the open chat yeah, session. Okay. Uh, so Mike White has got a presentation on his power supply that he built for his Swan re receiver. So are you there, Mike? Can you hear me? Can hear you. Okay. Um, just bear with me a second while I uh, try to pull this up. Uh, let's see. Here. Uh, yeah. So let's start the show. Right. Oh. Okay. Do you do you guys see that? No. Oh. All right. I'm going to end that then. So it's, it's two buttons. First, select the thing you want to share. Then you have to click the blue button that says share. Okay, that's the problem. Now I've got uh, the uh, slideshow took over my monitor. So I'm, I'm trying to uh, uh, add this line. No. Let's get out of this one. Okay, so... Sorry, so I, if if I hit, let's see, that's. So the easy way to do it is to, oh, you're sharing now. Okay, what do you see? Uh, Word document. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's not the one I wanted to show up there, but uh, try this. Okay, we're seeing a PowerPoint now in the viewer mode. Okay, now if I try to start this, I don't know if it'll work or not. Comes up on the other screen. So switch the monitor you're sharing to the other screen. Um, 
So I'm sorry, which I, I see new share. Is that what I should pick or? Yes. Okay. Okay, do you see that now? We're still seeing the slideshow in normal view. Oh, maybe I should just run it that way. I know you're behind. That's fine. Well, yeah, or you can just hit the slideshow thing on the bottom right that'll pop it open for the full screen. <clears throat> the problem is it's going to a different monitor. Yeah, I've got two monitors going on. I guess I used to this way. Um, all right, well, it's... Uh, and get rid of that. There, how's that? That works. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry for the uh, confusion there, but uh, uh, disclaimers. Uh, for one thing, uh, this project is not in itself a direct restoration of a vintage radio. It's a functional recreation of an accessory to the vintage radio without which the radio cannot function. Um, it's And it's made uh, largely with vintage parts. So you know, maybe that uh, qualifies it a bit. Um, the, uh, the other disclaimer, of course, you probably hear it all the time uh, in this hobby, but uh, there's high voltage present in uh, power supply circuits. Uh, this one in particular, up to 800 volts unloaded. So uh, you do this at your own risk. I, I certainly did too. Um, okay. So a uh, long run, long running item near the top of my to-do list has been to get on the air on six meter sideband. I thought this would be a good do-it-yourself opportunity and expended a fair amount of time and energy trying to build a small six meter rig. Uh, is it here? There it is. Uh, uh, here we go. Um, Although I was having fun monkeying around, I made precious little progress. But in July 2018, when I took my grandson to a ham fest in Milwaukee, I saw a Swan 250 on the table. A little bit rough looking. It would certainly need some work, but overall I liked the look of it. I thought it resembled the uh, Swan 270B I've been using for eight years now. It was towards the end of the day and the seller was happy to sell it to me for 35 bucks. What I didn't realize at the time was that unlike the 270B with its internal power supply and speaker, the 250B does not come with an internal speaker or power supply. Whoops. Uh, looking for the companion power supply speaker combo on eBay, I couldn't find any within my price range, which was cheap. Uh, even if I'd found one, you'd have, I'd have to pay for it and also probably for, uh, you know, the uh, parts to uh, recap it. Uh, so that would have been pretty expensive. Uh, but certainly, uh, I have enough junk parts on hand to build one, right? Well, yes and no. Diodes, electrolytic caps, fuse holders, terminal strips, wire, eh, no problem. The key, the missing key part was the power transformer. Uh, looking at the manual for the 250, I found a table summarizing the voltage and current requirements. The high B plus uh, 800 volts at 300 milliamps and the low B plus uh, 275 at 150 milliamps seemed to be doable, but I was stuck on the filament supply, 12.6 volts at four and a half amps Another looming problem was the minus 110 volt DC uh, bias voltage, which they want. It actually draws 100 milliamps in the 250. Uh, and of course, I wanted to preserve the 250 in its original design as much as possible. Let's see. I dug through my piles of rusting iron, but could not find a good solution. <laughs> this is just some audio transformers. I, I have a bunch more. Uh, but then when I was uh, talking to Bill Cohn at a Warkey meet in September 2018, he said he had a homebrew power supply from 30 years ago for a Heathkit transceiver. He told me he, it was just sitting in his house taking up space and he'd gladly give it to me, which he did. Thanks, Bill. 
When I examined the homebrew supply, it seemed like it was built out of old color TV parts. The chassis was a standard off the shelf type aluminum, a little bit light for this application, but adequate. It used two TV transformers, one for the high B plus supply and the other for the low B plus supply. The 12.6 volt filament supply was the in-phase series combination of each transformer's 6.3 volt filament winding. Very clever, Bill. So far, this looked promising. I didn't see a solution for the minus 110 volt 11 watt supply requirement, so one would have to be provided. I did some testing, took some data, came up with a plan. Uh, I ended up, pre ended up pretty much gutting the original power supply and reusing the chassis, the two big transformers, a filter choke, and a couple of can electrolytics. The rest is from my junk box. Uh, next slide. There we are. Right away, I saw one change I was going to make. Back in the day, both Heath and Swan ran one side of the AC power line on the power supplies DC output connector to the on off switch in on the radio, then back to the power supply. I never liked combining the hot and the cold sides of the AC line in the same cable and connector. So I decided to uh, include a small standby supply and a relay on the power supply itself so that only the uh, uh, so only the plus 12 volt DC would go through the cable and through the on switch back to the power supply, uh, energize the relay and turn the rest of it on. Uh, this change did not re require any modification to the radio itself. Okay, now the, the power supply. Uh, this is what I ended up with. For the plus 800 volts, I used four 1N4007s four in a full wave bridge on the high voltage secondary of T101. Uh, for the plus 275, uh, I used a voltage doubler on the high voltage secondary of T201. I reused the choke and added a larger output capacitor. Although those parts, those bits were roughly the, the same as what uh, the way uh, Bill had it, the, the original design. Uh, a, the 6.3 volt filament windings of T 101 and T201 were again series connected to produce a 12.6 volt supply for the uh, filaments and uh, out and then back in and the two in series. Um, a simple plus 12 volt DC supply for the relays on the 250 is a direct copy of the Swan circuit and values. I added a 12 volt 100 milliamp red indicator light uh, this LB140 on the front panel, which is powered by the plus 12 volt DC relay supply for the 250. This lamp lights to indicate that both T101 and T201 are powered and that the 800 volt and 275 volt supplies are available. If either F101 or F102, the fuses for those transformers opens, uh, that bulb will only glow dimly. The plus 12 volt standby supply uses a small 6.3 volt filament transformer, T001, with a voltage doubler. Uh, the, for the minus 110 volt supply, I found a 30 volt one amp transformer in my junk box. This was an old Zenith part, probably for an audio or monochrome TV product. I ran this to a voltage quadrupler circuit to obtain minus 150 volts when it's unloaded. For the a AC power line input, I removed the two-wire plastic line cord and mounted a Corecom style filtered power IEC connector. And that's it's, uh, FLT001. Since this is not a switch mode supply, uh, I didn't think I'd need to worry about conducting interference onto the power line, but I was concerned about interference from the power line conducting into the power supply and radio. Uh, the FLT001 should be equally uh, uh, effective in either direction. I also wanted to have a mains power switch, which switched both sides of the incoming AC line. I found an illuminated dual pole switch in the junk box and used it for this purpose. I included three fuses on the AC line, uh, a half amp fuse for the uh, standby supply and uh, two amp fuses for each of the two transformers. 
uh, T101 and T201. Uh, T201 also uh, is fused, that shares a fuse with T301. Um, since I don't, didn't have the correct Cinch Jones 8-pin chassis mount connector, I chose instead to use the same 11-pin octal-style connector that was used by Heath and make an adapter cable for the Swan 250. Oh, by the way, there we are. I, I tried to use the same pinout scheme as Heath, but I'm not recommending anyone plug a Heath kit transceiver into this power supply as is. And finally, some pictures of it. There's the front view. Um, you can see the uh, uh, some of the highlights, the standby relay, the uh, uh, on indicator, the standby and uh, power switch, the two big transformers, and uh, uh, a couple of the lytics. There. The back view, uh, there's the uh, po main power connector, uh, the fuse, two of the outside fuses, the uh, Corcom and IEC input here. Uh, let's see. Here's the bo chassis bottom view. Uh, you can see the, uh, uh, the power switch up here, the uh, 275 volt supply with the voltage doubler, uh, the output connector. Uh, we get uh, down here, there's the standby relay. Uh, the two, this is the power supply, the 800 volt supply, the, the two caps in series. Uh, here's the Corcom connector and a couple fuses there. Uh, the next one, there's the top view, uh, more of the same. Uh, you notice the shield uh, or the, the insulator on uh, C101, the, the top of the two uh, two series uh, capacitors on the 800 volt supply. So it's, uh, you don't use it as a handle while it's running. Uh, I, I did not get stung that way, fortunately. And here's a picture uh, unloaded just uh, with, the, with the supply plugged in, uh, with it's on, it's on standby and you flip the, uh, uh, I had a, stuck a little toggle switch in the back so I could turn it on and uh, uh, that switched on the main uh, radio. So it, it worked uh, to this point. Um, I put this, yeah, oh, okay. sorry, back to my narration here. Uh, put it all together and powered it up. No smoke, the lights went, the lights light up, standby relay works, all the voltages are present and their polarities are correct. But without loaded testing, I didn't want to plug the Swan 250 into it for fear of releasing smoke and breaking some irreplaceable parts. <laughs> so I had to come up with a way to test the power supply under full load in both receive and transmit modes. Hmm, time for some serious design work. Uh, I had a, I have a lot of power resistors, but it's, um, I don't have any magic ones that uh, fit uh, all those uh, exactly. Uh, it's it's still a simple problem though. It took a while. I cracked some books, but uh, and did some online searching. I just uh, decided to uh, concentrate, and I came up with an idea. Uh, for part two. <laughs> well, that's great, Mike. That's, uh, we got, you got us on the edge of our seats now. <laughs> but, uh, that, that was certainly a challenging project. And uh, I like how resourceful you were in, in getting all that stuff accomplished. And uh, uh, I think the best thing to do here is, is stay tuned for part two. And uh, in, in the effort, in the interest of uh, keeping our meeting moving along, I'm going to ask you to hang around to the very end if there's questions in the open session. And uh, when, whenever you bring part two online, we'll have those questions too, if, if, uh, if that's the case. So thank you very much, Mike. That was great. Uh, good work on that challenging project. So no, can right. I give one comment? I yeah. used that power supply for about four years on my HW101 and it actually went on the air before you changed it into something new. 
That's great, Bill. So it's repurposed, so it has a new life. There it is. So. All right, well, the last presentation before we get into the uh, items for sale and the sh show and tell is uh, Tom Kleinschmidt's part two of the right radio preservation series. And today he's going to talk about uh, cleaning and preservation. Tom? Don't hear you, Tom. Unmute yourself, Tom. We don't hear you. We see your screen, you're presenting, but we don't hear you. We cannot hear you, sir. I see his lips moving. Tom, can you hear us? All right, I got that fixed. Somehow when this went into full screen mode, it hosed up the world. Okay. Oh, hang on a minute. All right, let's get on with this. All right, sorry, everybody. Thought I had this knocked, but guess not. Just goes to prove. Anyway, so um, this is continuation from last week. So same, uh, same kind of overview. This is what I do. It doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Uh, so proceed at your own risk. Uh, this is the set as it came, pretty ugly looking. All this goop all over the uh, all over the cabinet. And uh, so we're going to go do uh, this chunk here. We're going to clean it up and polish it a little bit. I've also added a few steps here. And since people have requested how to repair, that'll be another series after we get done making this thing look good. So uh, that's the master plan. So uh, I'm talking about here using solvents and, and water's a solvent, by the way. And that's where I start. And um, so basically damp rag, like you clean anything else, some mild detergent, and then maybe petroleum based cleaners, but some of that stuff can dissolve plastic. So don't use gasoline. And then we, we're gonna get into some abrasives as well. And uh, because that's what this required. Sometimes you don't have to go that far, often you don't. So step one, I've got this green stuff. I can't tell you what it is. It isn't, doesn't appear to be biological and if it is, it didn't kill me. Um, and uh, so I wiped it down with a damp towel, dried it off, um, got, uh, you know, some of the, you know, the, the, the first layer of dirt, I'll call it off and uh, this is pretty straightforward stuff. You just need a bucket of water, a towel, a toothbrush, another soft brush, a cotton swab, a toothpick. You got to get into all the little grooves and all the little notches. Uh, but it's really important you rinse the damp rag often and change the water if you need to, because otherwise you're just going to smear around the same dirt you just took off. So that's kind of step one. That's where we are. Uh, little sidebar here. Some of these little spots, you can see this little black spot called uh, number one here. Uh, there are little things that are just stuck to the, uh, to the plastic and uh, with scraping with my fingernail, I was able to pop it off. Not all of them did. Uh, some of them are actually embedded into little defects in the plastic that's coarse and you can't get it out. But uh, this works for that. And uh, these are things that the brush wouldn't take out or the Q-tip wouldn't take out. And again, if you've got a brown Bakelite radio, you're not going to even see this, but on a cream colored or, or ivory colored radio, it just sticks out like crazy. So next step was goop. Goop is wonderful stuff. I, it, I got this tip from radio guys years ago, and what's really wonderful about it is it's pretty benign stuff. Uh, that being said, don't get on anything soft like paper or cloth or wire that is cloth covered or anything along those lines because it'll soak in and it'll stain it. But the other thing that's nice is unlike most of the cleaning products we use, this actually doesn't attack your hands. It actually makes your hands a little softer. I think there's some kind of a, of a cream in there to, to handle that for the hand cleaner side. 
Um, and the trick on this is you rub it on, it'll start changing color from the white to brown or black as it picks up the dirt, wipe it off, keep doing it until it goes, the same color white comes off as the same color white that went on. Uh, then you know you've got as much as it's gonna get cleaned with this product as it's gonna get cleaned. You don't use a lot of it, you just take a little dab like you would when you're gonna wash your hands, but you have to go and, you know, this is a rinse and repeat kind of thing, uh, just like the water part of it is. All these things are about time, they're not about difficulty. So then uh, the other thing I'm gonna recommend, and, and that's true of all these products, is keep the, the, it should say tub, not tough, but that's because I can't spell. Um, keep the tub covered, just, you know, you have to leave the, loose, the lead, bleh, lid on loose, uh, because, you know, this stuff will change state, uh, uh, you know, from being exposed to the air. So the other tip is you're gonna end up with a rag that's saturated with, um, uh, brain stuff with goop uh, and use that on the, where you have places where you have labels and go around the labels. You, you don't wanna get it on the label, but you wanna clean the area around it. So this gives you a very controlled way to get it around things. And obviously on the bottom of the cabinet in this case, I'm not like super concerned about it being perfect, but I wanna get all the dirt off. So again, it's a rub it on, rinse it off, avoid the labels and all will be well. So, Here's the public service announcement. The big deal here is if it says pumice, you just bought sandpaper, okay? Now, if you wanna do that kind of a finish, rock on. But what you want is the stuff that says multi-purpose. Uh, maybe called something else by other people. A, you know, you're probably familiar with Gojo and Permatex. And there's a whole bunch of people that make this waterless hand cleaner. You can get it at Menards, you can get it at, at Home Depot, you can get it at, uh, you know, the Napa store by me has the Permatex stuff. It's all the same stuff, in, essentially. Uh, but, you know, you really don't want the pumice. And, and it, obviously, you've all run across those things in the big orange pump bottles for cleaning your hands. That stuff's got pumice in it. Don't use it on your radio. So here's a sidebar. Now, you, you might have noticed that on the on the white cream radio, I didn't have that big an impact with the uh, with the waterless hand cleaner. This is an Atwater Kent Model 10. You guys might have seen the ad. We sold this radio on behalf of the lady that owns it. And uh, on the left was after I wiped it with a damp rag. On the right is after I did it with the with the uh, goop hand cleaner. Now, obviously, on the right, I also used a toothbrush and got into the small spots and rinsed it off and all that stuff. Now. You're not done at this point because it'll stay a little glossy until it evaporates off and it'll get slightly dull. But the amount of dirt that I took off, probably circa 100 years worth of dirt, because it's 1923 radio, uh, was just incredible. And it works good on the Bakelite. It works good on the table, but on this, but it doesn't work good on this cloth wire. You got to keep it off the cloth wire. Uh, down here is kind of a, I'll call it a, a plastic jacket wire. It's probably a shellac dipped fabric stuff, that was okay, it didn't care about that. Um, it won't polish anything, it just takes the dirt off. And uh, so more needed to be done, which we'll talk about when we talk about what we're doing in the, on, the, uh, on this radio, as far as keeping that kind of a look. So I needed to get to abrasive cleaning, why? Because all that green stuff didn't come off. So one of my favorite products is Never Dull Polish. It's getting a little tougher to find, this is a product my dad taught me about when I was a kid. His parents had a boat and anybody who's got a boat is polishing their brass with never dull. And the nice thing about it is unlike a liquid metal polish, it doesn't run all over the place. You have complete control of where it goes. If you don't touch it with this stuff, it doesn't, it doesn't get touched. So this is an old can of it here that I keep using. Uh, and it's basically kind of a, of a uh, cotton wadding with magic chemistry inside. And uh, so again, like uh, on the uh, on the and the and that movie with the kid that does karate, you know, wax on, wax off. You know, this is going to be a thing where you're going to uh, just go over it, wipe it off, uh, rinse it with water. Uh, in the case of this one, I had a little bit of white residue, which this stuff will leave behind. So I hit it with some naphtha, and that took it off. Then I rinsed the naphtha off with water, and 
yeah, I know it's a metal polish, but you know, keep in mind, we do a lot of things with a lot of things that weren't designed for the thing they're designed for. And I'm sure there's some warning label on here that would cause cancer in California and God knows what else. But this took all the green schmutz off. I mean, it just is gone. And hey, Tom, uh, yeah. Uh, I just picked up that Never Doll at O'Reilly Auto Shop, Auto Parts. Excellent. Yeah, so it was $10. And uh, thanks, Rudy. Um, so uh, the thing is, being that it's a polish, it will dull the plastic slightly. This is a, it gives you a lot, but as I mentioned here, it gives you some micro scratches. But we'll be making it all really super shiny soon. So the other thing you got to do is clean the knobs and the handle. Uh, my technique for this is just dunking it in a tub of clear water and leave it there for like, an hour. Don't leave it there for like a day because plastic will absorb water depending on the type of plastic. It's either devastating or just no problem, but you don't know until you find out the hard way. And again, a toothbrush does the trick. You know, all this crud that you see on this knobs came off with a toothbrush and there's the clean stuff on the lower right. Now, again, I've had knobs and handles that have been as uncooperative as that cabinet was and you need to get into the gojo or you need to get into the never dull and if that's what you got to do that's what you got to do but and i was fortunate in this case it was just soak it scrub it dry it off and all is well so here's before and after um it does look a bit better in my opinion uh we're going to talk about some other things next time uh, like fixing a crack that's in here. And uh, if anybody's got any ideas on these micro cracks that have dirt in them, what you can do to get that out, I don't have a solution for that. Uh, and then we'll get on another thing. So I, uh, I'm done with this one. So questions. Have you ever used any of the uh, products like Orange Aid or any of that to lift? And what is your thoughts on those, the liquid... Uh... Yeah, or I, I've used I've used simple green, uh, and simple green works really well too. Uh, I just didn't happen to use it on this one, as as you know, Ed. You know, you start playing chemist when you get into these things to try and figure out what works and what doesn't. I'm a huge fan of simple green, and I'm sure Orange Aid is something similar to simple green. Uh, and again, it's a product you need to rinse off, uh, and if. Yeah, there's a million things out there, but the, the whole important thing here is to use the least aggressive thing you can use to get the job done. That way you do the minimum amount of impact to the thing from when it was built, whenever it was built. This one's 1946 or 47, if I recall correctly. So um, you can get really carried away and, uh, and before you know it, you have an interesting piece of junk. So uh, yeah, so Ed, good question. Yeah, excellent stuff. Okay, yeah, I've had good luck with it on some uh, ham radio stuff with real fine uh, crinkle paint, and it lifts the stuff out, but doesn't seem to harm things. So uh, that's why I've used that, because uh, it promises to be benign, but like you say, test with caution. Well, and Ed, as you know, some of that paint, you get it a little bit wet and it starts to lift because it's not stuck to that well, especially if you have old products that have aluminum cases that were painted. Aluminum has been a challenge forever to paint because it oxides immediately. Um, and yes, I've had good luck with that. And I've used the Gojo as well with a brush because I'm assuming when you're using that orange aid, you're using a brush on that wrinkle because you have to kind of get down in there. Uh, and uh, maybe not, but uh, yeah, both of those things have worked. So, yeah, uh, I use, use my oldest worn out soft toothbrushes if I apply a brush. I use the softest one I've got if I think I need one. Yep, yep, same thing. All right, anybody got anything else? Yeah, I got a question. Uh, can uh, ha Have you ever used acetone on a Bakelite or Catalan radio? Um, I've used naphtha. I, 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 acetone is kind of one of those third level, really a great, a great aggressive kind of stuff. The other thing I've done with brown Bakelite um, is once you get it clean, you can use some of the Howard uh, uh, furniture uh, scratch filler stuff. Uh, that, that works really well to bring the color back. 
And you can also use shoe polish and buff it. Uh, I have a friend that was restoring old telephones and the handset receivers, which were Bakelite, would get really dingy, nasty looking with age and he'd clean them off and hit them with shoe polish and, and just buff them like you would a shoe and they looked like new. So, uh, uh, you know, acetone is one of those things I use very selectively because it is really aggressive stuff, but uh, I'm glad you've had good luck with it. Oh, I, I didn't say I'd had good luck with it. Um, I was, I know it will destroy a lot of stuff, but um, I heard on the cattle and sets that change color that you could use the acetone and it would remove a thin layer to, to bring back the color. I, I've never tried it. All right. Well, the problem with Catalan is, you know, you've got a, a very large investment that you're playing experimenter with. And I don't have any Catalan stuff, so I've never messed with it. I, so, you know, these various plastics do have their different characteristics. And I can't tell you what kind of plastic this radio is made out of. Uh, but uh, it suffers from a million hairline cracks, I'll tell you that. Okay, I'm, I'm going to interrupt at this point, Tom, and, and thank you very much for that presentation because we're squeezed for time now. Um, so thanks very much, and we'll uh, look forward to the next continuing saga, and it's been a great uh, thing to watch. So, Matt, do you want to put up your polls now that you have remaining um, so we can get a handle on how many items there are for sale. So there you go. So there's a poll for you guys to answer. So we can get an idea. And so what we're going to be doing, the remainder of our going to uh, talk about items that are for sale. We're going to do our uh, show and tell. And we've got four show up here so let's let's try to move through this in the remaining so it looks like we have two items for sale um, so Tom uh, you want to kick off the items for sale uh, section right now yeah yeah um, if you guys would do me a favor when you go into the chat put in your contact information what you have for sale and how much you want for it. Then I can just extract it out of there and send it out in the email that's the follow-up to this. It would make it a lot easier. I, in the past, I've written a million notes and I'm never sure I get it correct and I don't want to mess you up. So whoever's got something for sale uh, or, or wanted, uh, please uh, jump on in. Uh, this is David Sappenden speaking. Uh, I am looking for uh, something that seems to be pretty hard to find. They are white or cream colored knobs. There's a set of three that go on a 58 Philco Predicta Cyclops TV. I have two, I'm missing one. <laughs> I haven't been able to find them anywhere. So I thought I'd put the word out. Thank you. All right. Can you put a picture of them? Uh, no, that's a great idea. I'll get one for next time. All right. The other thing is, I'm not sure how woke you are, but Jay Volke in the in Archie in, in our club deals a lot with knobs. He may be a guy that can help you out. Jay Volpe? Yeah, V O L K E. Okay, thank you. Yeah, David, if you could put your contact information in the chat window, then uh, you know people may uh, contact you after the meeting because we'll. Not now, we'll thank you. What was the name of the uh, Fulco? Predicta. Predicta. That's the one with the CRT that sits on top of the cabinet. Right. It's a barber pole, the Cyclops model. You know, the big, looks like a big Cyclops sitting on top of it. And there's three cream color knobs that go with it. And somehow or another, we lost one. I don't know how. Right, I, I, in the in the chat window, David, if you could, yeah, there you go, great, thank. You. Right, and, and also all the details because I think the knobs vary by model in fifty eight. Okay. Yeah, so the model number of the set might help on that case. All yeah, right. The more information, okay. the better, David. You know, whatever you can do is convenient. We're not we're not trying to dictate to you; just trying to. Yeah, no, I'm novice here, and <laughs> just. Uh, well, we are too. We just masquerade as knowing what we're doing. 
Uh, All right, so David, if you don't mind, because I know the schedule is tight, I'm, 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 I'm the second person, so I'm going to jump in quick here. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, I am restoring this signal generator. And, uh, and back to the comment we had earlier, I cleaned all the green wrinkle on this with, uh, with the goop and a toothbrush. And this guy actually works, although it's been messed with over the years. And just want to say a couple things real quick. I just think it looks cool. And the power transformer has a date of 1 July 1938 stamped on it. And uh, it's roughly um, a foot wide. And uh, hang on a second, I was, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, there it is. Yeah, it's a foot wide, about nine inches deep, uh, about nine inches high. And the whole back of the cabinets is wonderful black wrinkle. As I mentioned earlier, this front is made out of aluminum. You can see the paint's coming off. The back is made out of steel. It's on there like concrete. But what I need is any information on this thing, because you know, very little inf information is published publicly like a writer's for test equipment, although Riders has some things for the more popular brands. Plow Brengel was a Chicago company. As you can see here, it's a model OCX. It's got uh, three or four tubes in it. And so it's just an AM signal generator. Uh, the only other fun fact I'll share and then I'll get off is this, these, both of these dials were a, were a dark cream color. And then, and this is engraved and backfilled with black. Underneath this knob, it's much darker faded from the from light. This side was so messed up, I just polished it down to the aluminum and then put some wax over it. And uh, so, it, like I said, it does sort of work, but it's been modified and I'd like to get it, uh, you know, to the way it should be. I'm gonna probably end up tracing the circuit. The other fun fact is the output connector here is a uh, bayonet lamp socket from like a number 47 light bulb. And that same technology is used in cars of the 1930s to hook the lighting up underneath the car. So because I messed with old cars, we had some of that stuff. So I made up a cable which has the right connector on the end. Although I'm sure I could have busted a light bulb and done the same thing. So that's it. Anybody got that, that would be really helpful. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Tom. Any other items for sale or information that's needed? Uh... Okay, uh, Matt, have you got the uh, be a presenter poll ready to go? I'd like to encourage you all to be presenters, and if uh, if you can, please do so. Matt's got a poll here that's uh, to see if you're interested. And you know, as you see, we had two newcomers today, newbies, if you want to call them that, to the. And they did a great job and uh, something that's a lot of fun. And we all appreciate you guys sharing your information with us and your passion for the hobby. So uh, answer the poll and be a presenter. I just wanted to give a plug to the Early Television Museum, which I put in the chat too. Their club meeting is tonight at seven o'clock and anybody can log on, you don't have to be a member. Uh, and if you don't wanna log on to Zoom, you can watch it. It will be streamed on YouTube. And I believe it's earlytelevision.org. Yeah, you could put that in the chat window. That would be uh, helpful. Thank you, Bill. Okay, well, we almost got everybody voted. Okay, give this uh, 10 more seconds and then we'll end. It looks like we've got some interest in doing so, so that's great. I think uh, it's a wonderful thing that we can all share these ideas and presentations. Okay. Well, that's good stuff. Thanks for uh, sharing your uh, ideas and answering the poll. So the final thing we're gonna do today is something new that we haven't done before, which is the show and tell section, which is kind of more of a free form uh, approach. 
uh, to showing and telling <laughs> and not very formal. And from our poll earlier, we have four uh, and we have 15 minutes to go. So do the math. You, you got three minutes each to go. So whoever's got one, uh, join in and start sharing. You really only have three. I hit the wrong button. <laughs> okay. Okay, who's going to be the first? Uh, I'm willing to go first. Uh, I'm Ken Carlson, and uh, I'm not exactly sure how to get the, to share this screen. There is a screen share uh, icon on the bottom here. I'll click on it and see what the heck happens. That's what you need to do. And then uh, something up else has come up here now. So you, you select the monitor that you want to share. Just use the top row with the monitor and select which one you want to share. And oh. then. There it we hasn't go. come up, has it? We're, we're seeing your website. Um, yeah, we see your mouse. Well, I'm baffled now. I don't know where to go. Do you have like a PowerPoint or a photo that you're trying to bring up? No, oh no, I just want uh, the picture larger because I have the radio behind me. But uh, if you just view it on that small picture that I'm uh, one of the multiple pictures, it's awfully small. You can't do that with screen, screen sharing. Oh, you can't? No. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe what you could do is uh, just can you point the camera at the real radio and just talk to it? Yeah, I'll try and do that. Okay. We can all make, we can all switch um, to speaker view and we'll see you full screen. Oh, okay, that might work. Okay, I wanna get... Uh... You gotta stop sharing your screen. Move your mouse to the top of the screen. It says stop sharing. Stop sharing. Oh, I see it. Okay, here we go. Uh, a little difficult with a laptop because uh, it has the built-in uh, camera. Yeah, we see it. Okay, great. Uh, this is an RCA Victor uh, portable it's from 1958, uh, 115 volt AC DC and uh, battery. And uh, it has several uh, interesting things about it. Uh, first of which, at that time they were still using the uh, Nipper logo, which kind of surprised me because that's rather late 1958, but it is uh, RCA Victor. Uh, it also has uh, this feature, it has a movable antenna so that uh, if you're at the beach or something, there's a lot of uh, background noise, you just face it towards yourself where you can get a good shot from the speaker and then uh, adjust your antenna for the best reception. Uh, also, another interesting thing, the chassis is actually on the top. And the chassis is quite light compared to the batteries. There's a 90 volt uh, B battery and uh, a seven and a half volt A battery. And so they've uh, mounted the chassis upside down. Oh yeah, you can see it. They've mounted the chassis upside down and you have the heavier batteries on the bottom. So uh, it's not top heavy. It gives it more stability. Uh, also, for a radio, uh, inexpensive radio like this, it's kind of interesting that it has a geared tuning. So you can really do some pretty fine uh, tuning and selectivity with this. But uh, anyhow, I like it. It's uh, a radio that we had. This particular one is not, but we had one just like it when I was in high school. And we, we listened to Wally Phillips every morning. It sat in the kitchen for years and uh, it... Uh, the only thing was that in 1963, I couldn't get batteries for it anymore. But uh, anyhow, that, that's what I got to show. Thank you.
Well, it's great, Ken. Uh, thanks. Thanks for sharing that with us. That's, and you did that in a in a very smart three minutes of total time. That's that's keeping in the spirit of things here. <laughs> so, who else has got something they'd like to do uh, show and tell with? Well, I've got this item, Mike Sauer, up here in Wisconsin. Yeah. Let's see if I can show this so you can see it. Was that one of those things that adapted an antenna to your power your power line? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's real hard to, to show it here. It looks like a looks like a cord with just a one a cord plug with just one one prong on it. Heaven forbid the capacitor fails in there. Yeah, I was uh, sounded to be pretty brave to use that. <laughs> Found it probably at a radio fest sometimes. One of those things you just find when you're straining up to shop, but on, on the top. You know, it says uh, it says Eagle has a nice Eagle logo on there, along with the connection point. Just the single prong plug, of course, it's not polarized. You can plug it in either way. But uh, in addition to the to the Eagle logo on the top, it uh, says on the bottom there antenna, so that you you know that's that's your connection point there. And uh, it, it I ohmed her out. I mean, there's a uh, no no conductivity right now between the uh, between the prong here and the and the antenna connection on one side. There's about an eighth of an inch gap between the screw head on the bottom by the prong is uh, definitely the other end of the bolt here that where you hook the antenna on. But no conductivity right now. But uh, yeah, it'd be kind of brave. I I suppose it was meant when if you used it. I, I suppose you wouldn't want the grounded side of the power circuit, but. Uh, <laughs> Just some of those things you came across and thought, wow, yep, might have to be a little brave to, to use something like that. In today's world with so much junk on the power lines, all it pick up is a lot of buzz and yeah. switch mode power supplies. Doesn't have a UL sticker on it or anything, so. <laughs> oh, well, just one of those things I found and uh, that, that's all I had today. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Mike. That's uh, real interesting. Um, anybody else? Yeah, I've got a couple of pictures to share. I'm not sure if it'll work on a tablet, but I'll give it a shot. Yeah, give it a shot. Right, let's see. Let's... Can you see a picture? Yeah. Okay. That's a cabinet from a 1937 Philco. Model 37600C. I picked this up uh, the last Warsi meet, uh, March 15th, the very last uh, in person antique radio meet. It was nicely refinished. I got home though, and I realized that something didn't seem right about it. And I realized it was supposed to have a uh, full finish on it. And let's see if I back this up. Oh, that didn't work. There it is. That's how it was supposed to look. We're still and, seeing uh, the first picture. Still seeing the first picture, huh? Let's see. Probably got to go back and reshare. Well, you're probably sharing the picture, not the screen. Right. So, yeah. So, still on the first picture. Okay. Yes. The knobs. Anything change? <laughs> you probably need to unshare the first picture and then share the second picture. Okay. Now let me get back to where I need to be here. I think he unlogged off. Uh -oh. <clears throat> Logged off or muted?
I don't see him anymore. I think he. Uh, yeah, I think he he he, he, he dumped himself. I hit the wrong button. All right. Well, we've lost we've lost Greg. So anybody else have something to share? If Greg comes back, we'll pick him back up. But anybody else? Yeah, Tom Hale boys here in Milwaukee, uh, working on a project. The uh, 1918, the Forest Crystal Set, the SCR 54A. It's the one with all the stuff in the lid. And what I'm missing is the nameplate. It's an inch and three quarters by uh, three inches long. It's brass. This is definitely the DeForest version of it. So I'm looking for a replacement nameplate. Or if somebody's got an old junker that has one on it, uh, I put my my uh, email address on the uh, in the chat. So. And it's, uh, it's definitely the SCR 54A, not the BC 14 or BC 14A. So that's all, thanks. All right, thanks, Dale. Um, I don't know if Greg came back or not. <laughs> Greg's back. I'm back, I haven't found the picture yet. I think I closed everything. <laughs> okay. You do on a tablet out there trying to figure something else out. But. Okay, well, um, we're almost out of time. We got four more minutes. I want to remind everyone, if you want to save the chat window, do so now. Uh, you go down to the lower right corner and you see the three dots, uh, the ellipsis as they're officially called. And you can use that to guide you to how to save the chat window. So all this information that's in there, you can just have it in a file and reference it. Um, Greg, if, if you don't have your photo to show us you could you could still talk if, if you got something to add all right well anyone else have anything to add to the show and tell uh, i just wanted to mention uh uh lynn walter who's been on uh, wbbm for 52 years he's retiring his last day of broadcast will be this coming friday and uh, he was the business uh, news editor. I'm sure many of you have heard of him, but I think it's quite remarkable. He's 82 years young and he's retiring down to Florida and uh, his last broadcast will be this coming Friday. Len Walter. Oh, yeah, I saw that in the tree press. Okay, um, thanks for that, Ken. Uh, Greg, you, you have nothing further? Then uh, I guess I'll just turn this over to the open session for the next few minutes. And then when Matt decides to pull the plug, we'll, we'll have the plug pulled. But I wanna thank everybody today for uh, a great meeting. Sorry I had to rush things along at times, but uh, we had a lot of good stuff come by and uh, let's keep it up. So we'll see you all next month. Thank you. <laughs>